Good evening, everyone. Please be seated. This is an extraordinary general meeting that I'm meeting tonight. I call upon the Secretary to read the minutes of the last meeting. I propose the minutes be taken as read. Seconded. It's been proposed and seconded that the minutes be taken as read. Is this your will? Aye. Is it further your will that I sign these minutes to show an accurate record of the last meeting? Aye. Aye. Yes, Are there any questions for officers? There being none, is there any private business? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Come on, please. We only have four tickets left. Um, so they're really, really going really fast. It is on the 26th of February. Make sure you grab yours. £53 for members, £65 for non-members, and it really should be a great event. We're all going to include afterwards. It's in the Undercroft at the UNESCO World Heritage Site, so it's a really a once in a like really good opportunity to do that. So hope to see you all there. I've got an announcement myself. Uh, early today, the General Committee passed a new and major amendment to the Constitution, which is the institution of the new complaint panel, which is there to ensure the actions and behaviour of General Committee members and society members, <coughs> and especially our officers, which is not very exciting, it's just repute. Um, there will be three members on this panel, one of which will be the office manager serving as a representative of the trustees. Two members will be composed of ordinary members, which will include a panel based on um, former officers and former members of the Rules Committee, as well as current members of the Rules Committee. Application forms will be um, established shortly, and the aim is to, is to set up this panel within a week. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. And um, we now move to the main business of the meeting. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. President, for seeking the chair. And so we have now the election of the president for Michaelmas 2019. Nominations were open between uh, last Saturday and this last uh, Thursday, and the following candidates have been uh, our own. We have Jack Perry of St Cuthbert Society, proposed by Sarah Kaczynski of University College and seconded by Helen Patton of St Mary's College. We have Alice Sledge of University College, proposed by Rory Flynn of Hatfield College and seconded by Kate McIntosh of St Cuthbert Society. And finally, of course, we have reopened the nomination of no such fixed vote. Uh, without, so candidates will be hustling for uh, just over five minutes each, then there will be the chance for questions, uh, then the candidates will leave the room and their proposals will hust for four minutes each and there will be questions of the proposers and then we should be done. So uh, as is the custom, the candidate who gets the nomination in first goes first, so I uh, now give the floor to Jack Perry of St Cuthbert Society to host the Michaelmas Presidency in 2019. Uh, Mr Perry, the floor is yours. Thank you and good evening. When I ran for secretary, I stood here and I said this union is at a fundamental turning point. <laughs> that we need to reach out to a wider audience than ever before. So when elected, I embarked upon the biggest publicity campaign this union has ever seen. We reached hundreds, thousands of people over summer before term had even begun. The first event of term had nearly 1,000 people who clicked going or interested on the Facebook event. That's enough to fill this chamber more than three times over. But there are two things that are vital for any society. Reach is one that we now have. Engagement is the other that we need. We need to make the people we reach out to feel like they can be a part of something bigger, like they want to come to events, like they want to get involved. Because this union is so much more than just a gathering of members. It's a concept, an idea, a fundamentally shared belief in the power of intellectual curiosity and a desire to learn more about the world we inhabit. When you walk through that door, each and every one of you brings something, not a single one, of the thousands of others who have walked through that door before you could bring. I genuinely believe that every last member is valuable, uniquely valuable, from the quiet contemplators to the most vocal of speakers, and even to those who watch our videos at home. 
And ultimately, it's not about who sits in the chair. It's not about who invites speakers or who asks the secretary to read the minutes of the last meeting. It's about who can harness the incredible potential of our members. Who can bring together this incredible group of individuals and encourage them to seek more, to think bigger. So how do I want to do it? How do we build this community? How do we create a union that engages a wider audience than ever before? Well, first of all, look at the set of debates on my manifesto. They're designed so there's something for everyone. And this is before you even take into account the feedback uh, and the, the, uh, the feedback survey leaflets that my, my campaign team are handing out with, with my manifestos. If you don't see something you like, tell me what you want to see. I want to hear what you guys think. I also want to create a Durham Union app, which would allow members to, to order stash, to vote in elections, to book socials, and so much more. And I think a dedicated outreach officer position would be a fantastic addition to general committee to work with other societies across the university and really build an open and welcoming space here at the Union. Now, I don't have time to run through all my pledges, unfortunately, but I'm, I'm very well open to, to questions from anyone after this, or indeed at any point in person throughout the week. But first, I'd like to ask you guys a question. Who in this room has ever thought to themselves, by show of hands, yeah, the Union's all right, but it could do better? Fair enough. And how many of you have subsequently thought of ideas which could help us improve? I don't worry, I'm not going to you know, put you on the spot and ask you to name them or anything. <coughs> I think it's just going to illustrate how much innovative thinking there is across our membership. So let's harness that ingenuity and originality of our members and let's use it to drive real progress in the union. It shouldn't just be officers that can contribute to the running of this society. Every last one of you has something to bring to this union. Your union. Our union. This term card. The first I ever saw of the union. I remember picking it up at my first Freshers' Fair last year. And I remember flicking through, seeing all the incredible names of speakers. Professor John Curtis. Natalie Bennett. Professor Alan Sked, and so many more. And I remember walking through the doors of this very chamber for the first time for a debate on this House believes liberalism is in retreat. I want every member to feel that sense of excitement that I felt when I first walked through those doors. I want every member to want to come here, to want to be a part of this incredible chamber of ideas. The union doesn't belong to any one person. And I'll say it again, it's not about who sits in that chair. It's about who sits on these benches. It's about the kind of union we want to be a part of. The kind of community we want to build together. That is my vision. With your support, we can make it a reality. So let's get started. Thank you. Durham's an old, largest and oldest society comes with responsibilities. It comes with duty to the duty to the community that we're in, the university that we are a part of. Jack is absolutely right when he says that we need to make a decision about what kind of community we want to build. We just have disagreements over what kind of change we need to make in order to get there. 
In my manifesto, I've outlined substantive reasons and substantive methods to make change to the community itself. Just to run through a few of them. I agree with Jack that we should be working more with the societies around us. I think this is a great idea. I don't think this requires its own officership. I think this instead should be, should be changed through the suggested speaker form. We should revamp it, we should make it an application process. So people who have unique links to people who we would love to host, who we can only get through working with the society, who they, they need our resources to put it on, we can work together, we can collaborate, we can make some special things happen together. The members' choice debate, I think that's a fantastic idea. You know, the same thing is happening on our campaign. I've not named any debates because I'm waiting for people to come in and tell me what kind of debates they want. And we've been getting tons and tons of messages telling us exactly what they want to see. The ideas have been fantastic and I can't wait to share them on the Facebook page. Um, accessible membership. During my time in Equalities, one of my major long-term projects was trying to get an accessible membership program that was amenable to the trustees and that could secure the financial stability of this union. I think we have worked out a plan that is both uh, useful to the students on the Durham Grant who desperately need this help so that they can get involved in the society and also one that does not threaten the finances of the union, especially given that currently we are in a fragile position due to our low membership figures for this year. Also, the view of an outreach officer. Again, I agree, with, I agree that that's a fantastic idea. I just view the outreach officer to be a different thing. I don't think an outreach officer is required to do a stash order. I think that an outreach officer should instead work to engage with the city of Durham, the community partners who we want to work with, do real substantive work to make a positive impact on everyone around us. There are so many things that we can do. We have some of this country's best debate trainers here, and why aren't, why aren't we sharing this resource with people? Years ago, the union used to have a school's debating programme where people could sign up, they could learn the trade. This was ma massively beneficial to loads of kids in this area, the North East particularly, being on average a more deprived area than everywhere else. We have these resources and for minimal effort, just some of our debaters giving up their time, which having spoken to them, they're more than willing to do, we can create these new partnerships, change our image, which is the cosmetic consequence, but more importantly, make a real important change to people's lives. We cannot stand here and say that we are proud to have been here for 176 years without acknowledging the city in which we have stood. Better addresses. I think one of the reasons why we struggle sometimes to get people through the door is because we aren't putting on addresses that they're interested in. Our addresses, in my opinion, are fantastic, and I love going to them. However, we have 1,500 members-ish on campus, but yet there are addresses where we barely fill out this chamber. There are more of you here to listen to me and Jack talk than there were to professors and people who we pay a lot of money to come and speak to us. That's, that's not good. We're not that interesting. We should instead be prioritising our resources to make sure we get the best people in as, uh, as possible. There are some addresses which maybe are superfluous that we can cut out and instead use those savings to try and uh, to pursue the bigger fish. We have had talks with lots of interesting speakers who require flights or require more expensive travel arrangements that unfortunately we have had to let go despite interest on both sides. I think if we were more selective about who we offer the opportunity to address the society, we can create better addresses, not only in the quality of people who come here, but also the breadth of people who come here. As in my time with Qualities, I've been working for four presidents trying to expand the reach of the society as far as possible. I've been working with sports people, I've been working with musicians. There are new links which we can now take advantage of, and I believe that we should start pursuing these options, because in my time, there has only been, I think, one sports debate despite D, uh, Durham University being one of the best sports universities in the country and the body, the body of students that we represent overwhelmingly being interested in that sort of thing. The same, of course, goes for music. I think that the cosmetic change to our branding is not enough. I think that the responsibilities we have as the biggest and largest and oldest society in Durham go deeper than changing the way we communicate. I think we have to change the way we operate. I think we have to change the way we think. Jack is absolutely right when he says every member is valuable and every member is important. I think we should, I definitely think we should listen to them. I think that the way we get them back is showing that we are more than what we are currently act, uh, acting like. We offer more things. We get more involved with the community around us. We show that we stand for ideals that are more than ourselves. I think we do this through engaging with the city of Durham. I think we do this by engaging with the student societies of Durham. I think we do this by engaging with our members in Durham. I think we do this by making a real substantive change. And I think we don't do this 
through Glossier Facebook ads. Thank you. societies who would love the security and the sort of resources that we have. They are extremely envious of the opportunity we have here. And at the same time, they are wondering why sometimes we don't take more advantage of using this size and using this presence I have. So firstly, I just think it's the, the fact that we are such a huge organisation. Secondly, I think it's our tradition. We have stood here for 176 years. It is my sincere hope that we stand here for another 176. I think the fact that this institution has practices that, you know, that are important to its members and important to the way that we operate, I think this is something that we should seek to preserve. I think this makes us more than. I think there is a way that we can present ourselves and there is a way that we can act and conduct ourselves that means we, we show ourselves to be more than these traditions, which shows our ideals and our ideas about how we debate to be more than, you know, dressing up in black tie and sitting on the front bench. I think there are ways that we can engage with that in the community and through our student societies. I think that is how we use the size that we have and the traditions that we have to stand for something that is larger than ourselves, which is hugely beneficial to everyone in Durham. Jack? Well, I think it's it's essentially the pitch that I gave when I when I stood at the Freshers' Fair at the beginning of this year when I organised the Freshers' Fair and I said to everyone that came, this is this is how we sell us <coughs> because we're it's it's what I said in my speech we're so much more than just than just a gathering of members it's 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 the the ideological belief and the foundations that we this society is built on that really make us different that really set us <coughs> apart and it's it's not just the debates it's the it's the socials, it's the, it's the networking, it's the, the student debating and the competitive competitions. There's so much more to the society than first meets the eye and there's so much more than, than just a, an ordinary debating society. But, yeah, you know, I think you're right, I think we do, if we're not careful, risk becoming, yeah, just, just another debating society. If we don't engage people, if we don't adopt the right science and we don't adopt uh, the right policies, and I, I genuinely believe that what I, the vision I have and, and the policies that I'd like to bring about, especially um, in terms of social media engagement, but um, also the, the way we approach um, debates and, and, and offering debates that really um, give everyone an opportunity to, to express their views. I think that's the way we bring people in, that's the way we engage people, and that's the way we remain very much more than just your, your run, standard run-of-the-mill debating society. Uh, any more questions? Uh, yes. Uh, could the candidates please outline their internal experience in the union and how this prepares them to be president? Uh, Jack. Yeah, so um, <laughs> I basically got involved in the union about as early as, as was possible. Um, I was on House Committee first um, in my very first few weeks at Durham. Um, I got involved <coughs> straight away uh, and then I, by the end of Michaelmas term last year um, I was elected Assistant Secretary. Um, and that was, and then 24 hours later, um, became acting secretary. Um, <laughs> um, and so that was that was quite interesting. Being that was very much sort of dropped in at the deep end. But I basically took it on on the chin, and we, we got stuck in um, over Christmas. I tackled the digitisation minutes. Uh, I made sure everything was in order, organised everything, um, and then of course we all got secretary. Um, after that, I still decided to let him run. I continued as assistant secretary, um, and I was also on uh, Ollie Lewis's president's committee as well, so where I got involved in inviting a bunch of speakers. Um, so there's a bit of experience there as well. Um, I got speakers such as Anne Pettiford, um and Rob Senior, for those of you that have been here for more than a year will know, um, from Easter term last year. Um, and then, of course, uh, I was elected secretary uh, at the end of last year, 
um, and ever since I've been working, especially over summer, um, working on that publicity drive, working on that image of the union and trying to, trying to really reach out to people. And now that we've achieved that, I think the next step is engagement. And I think I've got the experience to deliver that, given my, given my past experience in the union. Alistair? Cool. Um, so, unlike Jack, I didn't know that I was going to be on union exec uh, in my first week. I came here, I enjoyed the debates, but I thought, you know what, you know, I think the back rows are for me, because I was just having fun watching. Uh, and then I came to debates training, uh, I fell in love with that, uh, and I've been doing that ever since. Uh, my, first, uh, my first position in the Durham Union as official exec was on um, Ollie Lewis's press call, me and Jack worked together. Um, but yeah, that was, a, that was a laugh, I enjoyed it uh, a tremendous amount. Um, the, the thrill of inviting and getting some back, you know, one good reply in every 20, that, that was the kind of stuff that keeps you going. And that's what drove me to then become the equalities officer. Uh, because in my time I've realised that uh, I just w witnessed the Michaelmas term in which about 3 in 20 speakers <coughs> were, were women. And I was looking at the fact that, you know, this, this, this building has the capacity to like lift people up and do so much more and actually reflect the national political discourse. And so I decided to run. Um, I ran. Uh, I won, and then I spent the next year trying to make uh, the Durham Union a fairer place. So, uh, under my tenure, I'm really like proud to have said that um, we've been able to radically improve uh, and increase the proportion of women and uh, black minority ethnic speakers that we've had. Uh, I also worked extensively on an active membership project, which didn't come through, but uh, is now here on the table in some form. Um, I also have been working with the members survey project to try and like uh, justify uh, what people want, try to be responsive to our members. Uh, which is data that's been used by uh, our sponsorship department. Um, I also did the first gender audit of our membership because a lot of our sponsors were asking for our gender breakdown uh, and because we weren't able to give them that we were often losing out on leads and clients. Uh, we've now got that information and it has proved valuable in, in pursuing uh, sponsorship. Uh, I've also, in the debate side, uh, been the co-convener of Durham Schools, which is the largest uh, residential debates competition in the world, which brought in about £7,000 uh, to the union last year. I also co-convened the Durham IV this year, which brought in just under a thousand, uh, about eight hundred pounds, uh, which was a forty-team comp, uh, which is um, a higher level than what we normally get. Usually, we get about thirty-two because of where we are uh, geographically. I'm also a novice debate trainer, so some of my kids are here today, which I'm really pleased to see. Uh, but I train them in debates on on Mondays, um, to teach them the teach them the ropes, uh, and I'm very proud to see <coughs> all gone and flourished uh, on the intervarsity circuit. Uh, so, yeah, I've, I've got a broad range of experience. Oh, um, and I went to Serbia. I went to Serbia to represent uh, the Durham Union Society uh, at the Euros as a judge uh, for debate. So, yeah, I, I've been everywhere. They sent me places that were a bit dodgy, some, some, some strange uh, hostels along the way, but it's been, it's been jolly good fun. I wouldn't change a minute of it. And, yeah, so I've seen every side of the Union there is to see. Who uh, is uh, next? Um, oh, um, I'd just like to kind of sort of briefly outline how they would deal with the sort of, well, shit show of the first um, and that sort of thing. Like, if they were elected president, I think it's uh, pretty obvious to anyone that's paying attention that there is some um, animosity towards the union from certain groups of people out there who are voicing their opinions on the internet. And I think, um, I don't think it's been handled very well to date, and I'd like to hear what the candidates have to say as to how they would handle that situation. Thank you. Um, I think the way to change people's minds about the kind of institution we are is to, to change. To be a better institution and to be the one that people want us to be, right? Like, there are, there are legitimate concerns that have been in, raised in amongst the personal attacks which have been, you know, disgusting and wrong. But, in terms of some of the ideas and the themes of people not feeling engaged, not feeling welcome into this society which they have paid their membership dues for, and have just as right to feel as comfortable as here as anyone else that's in the chamber, I think the way we do this is by actually improving a society and trying to reach out to these people, trying to show that we've changed, running more things to make that clear. I think things like the LGBT plus panel are super important uh, in trying to you know, reach out to groups that we haven't previously talked before. Talked to before. I think reaching out to other societies to try and broaden the range of stuff that we do is also important. Um, I, Rahul mentioned the complaints panel that got passed today, but I am absolutely thrilled that we now have some kind of accountability procedure uh, so that when people make mistakes and when people do things that bring the union into disrepute, uh, that we have a way of making sure that that can be handled and so that we as an institution can move, move on, rise above and keep going. Because at the end of the day, you know, we are striving for something more than, and I think in order to not necessarily appease the people of DFS, but to show them our values and to show them that we aren't just, you know, Tories with LinkedIn accounts. 
I think we we try to we, we strive for something greater. So charity programs, reaching out to people who we don't usually talk to, uh, running different kind of events, making everyone feel welcome, uh, enforcing this complaints panel. I think that's how we do it. Jack. Yeah, I agree with a lot of what Alistair said there, actually. Um, I think it's very unfortunate um, a lot of it's been thrown around, but we do need to reform the way our image looks. I think in terms of tackling the issue up front, as in if I've been in that position, uh, it's just about taking a step back and kind of recognising where the complaints are coming from, how to best approach them, and not kind of making knee-jerk reactions that basically exacerbate the issue. Um, things like the complaints panel, I think, are a really good step forward. I would agree, the one that was passed today. Um, are a really good step forward in that direction and helping people vent their frustrations um, in, through other means and in ways that we can actually um, use to build on. Um, but also in terms of diversity speakers, I think we, you know, this year we've had an LGBT panel, we've had uh, Baroness Farsi who gave an address on, on um, Muslim, as a, her experiences as a Muslim woman in politics. Um, we had Tanya Gray Thompson this term, which was a fantastic address. Um, we had a colonial represent, um, excuse me, reparations debate um, last term. You know, we had um, Damothine Donald who talked about uh, her experience of women in science. So we've we've got um, a decent ra track record of diversity. It's just about building on that um, and about creating more events like that. So my debate on uh, racism in Britain, for example, um, and um, again another LGBT panel I'd like to hold next year, as well as a mental health um, panel discussion. It's about kind of building on that record of speakers, building out on that record of discussions, and showing people that actually, yeah, we do want to talk about these issues that matter to everyone. Um, and I think that's, that's really important. On, I will just briefly mention the um, charity point as well. Um, actually, sponsorship are already beginning to, um, as I mentioned, we'll probably mention at some point, uh, in Gencom today, charity um, drives are already becoming a part of sponsorship. So we're, with the creation of an outreach office position, I think, you wouldn't necessarily need that because it can actually come under the remit of sponsorship, especially this time of year. Um, they're not actually doing a huge amount because a lot of sponsors haven't got the budget by this time of year to, um, to be sponsoring us. So they, this time of year could be uh, going out into town doing collections. Um, kind of suggested a few things like a uh, clothes drive or a, you know, a food drive and things like that that the sponsorship committee could organise. And I think that's a fantastic idea. I just don't think you need a whole new office position to do that. Um, I think sponsorship um, have, have the scope to do that and uh, indeed are already making plans to do that. Any more questions? Uh, Charlie. Well, <clears throat> the union's financial situation has been touched upon quite a few times tonight, and I was wondering if the candidates have made any attempt to cost their manifestos, and whether, if they have done that, they believe their proposals to be both possible and sensible. Uh, yeah, Jack. Yeah. Um, good stuff. OK, so um, I imagine uh, I've, had a, I've had a look through. Um, so the app is going to be the big one that people are asking about, I imagine. Um, the cost thing that, obviously. Um, the cost of an app very much depends on a lot of things. Um, you can basically get an app made for anything between nothing um, and tens of thousands of pounds. So it very much depends on the kind of app you want and, and how pragmatic we go about it and who we're going to be working with. Um, but I do think there's, there's definitely scope if we have, um, again, a, a person with pragmatism and experience in this sort of thing. Um, to get a good deal um, and to, to deliver something, and especially when you've got these these um, aspects of the union that we can we can grasp that will deliver a tangible benefit for all our members, we should be grasping the opportunity with both hands if we can at all. So things like the recording equipment for the chamber, um, which we spent around four hundred pounds on last term, um, you know, has delivered a tangible benefit. All our members can now watch our videos back on YouTube. Um, it's things like that that really can engage that wider audience that I think will deliver a very good long-term investment um, and, and, and deliver for that. Um, in terms of professional publicity videos, um, have a look. Uh, you can get things like that done for 50, 60 pounds online editing, um, but we've also got some people that are very talented editors here at the union. Um, so it's, I think it's very much possible to do that in-house depending on um, what we're looking at and, and what the budget's looking at like, at the end of this year for over summer. Um, stash will probably pay for itself, given that members will be able to order it um, online and then um, indeed we might even make a profit on that. Um, and I think that's everything that would be costed, unless you have any specific closures that you'd like me to discuss further than that. But so it's a sort of good overview, I think, of your uh, costing process. Good stuff. Um, so, so, Jack, you did, that, that was it for you, Jack? Yeah, no, cool. I'm Charles, happy. Yeah. Um, 
So just, just to come back on that app point, um, I costed it for him. Uh, so, uh, so you can go onto Google and you can get, fill in on a bunch of developers' websites like, hey, so I want this, 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 and this, and this. And then because they're developers and they're quite clever, um, they make you an app that then tells you how much your app would cost. Um, so the cheapest one that I found, and that is with cutting out some of the features that uh, Jack's outlined in the post on his Facebook page, uh, that was 33,000 US dollars. Um, I assume that the, the way the app works would be rejigged to make it cheaper. Uh, I'm more than willing to accept that there is a way in which this can be rejigged so that they, we don't have to run everything through the database and we don't have to change the database again to make this work. However, the effort that it takes to put an app together is enormous. It is a massive professional thing. Anyone who's been in the union exec for the last year knows how hard we've been fighting for a new website and how laborious that process is and how long we have been waiting and how many times uh, the Treasury comes back and says we need more money for this project. It's uh, at the moment I think meant to be about £7,000 for our new website and then £1,000 every year in upkeep. So I assume that an app would cost a similar amount of money to upkeep because you have to make sure that it works with bugs, our software updates and things like that. It has to work across multiple um, operating systems, iOS, Android, things like that. Why this app is so expensive, just to briefly explain, um, is that our membership database is uh, currently being rejigged. Uh, we've already paid for that uh, and that will be available in uh, hopefully uh, soon. To run e-commerce features through this database and to do personalised calendars is an expensive process because we have to change the way that it works again and rejig it again and then make it work from everyone's like user identified phones and make it an actual interface where people use it. I imagine a lot of you in this room only log into your union account to vote on their PC. Like if we started to get much more traffic there for people buying stash, reserving tickets for socials and things like that, like that fundamentally changes the way that this database operates and that is a massive upkeep. That is why it's expensive. Um, yeah, so although £33,000 is probably a large estimate, the most expensive one I found was $72,000, but I assume that that's just some Americans trying to rip me off. Um, as for my manifesto in terms of um, costings, uh, I think everything is pretty much neutral. Um, just to clarify the access membership, because I have been asked about this in person, um, the way that staggered payments would work is that you wouldn't be able to pay £20 and then decide I no longer want to be a union member and then not pay the rest. It would work like a direct debit, the same way that anyone <coughs> pays for any sort of deals, right? Like, no, we will not lose money because of this, this programme. Instead, we might even gain money because people who were previously unable to spend a lump sum at once will now be able to access the membership over a longer period of time. As for better addresses, uh, the, the pledge in the, um, in the manifesto, um, obviously this money will be rejigged around the way that we book these things. Um, our address, our, at the moment, well, as was said today in GenCom, uh, we pay about £160 for travel domestically in this country on average for our speakers. When you look at you know, uh, flights between October and December, off-peak times where plane companies want to offload tickets and sell things, these are cheaper, and I think, therefore, if you're paying £160 to get someone from London, it's not unreasonable to think that we can't pay £160 to get someone from Europe. Like, a flight to Chicago costs about, return costs about £320 into Newcastle during these dates, right? Like, so, you know, the, the possibilities are, are seemingly endless. However, obviously, fiscal responsibility is important as, because we've got falling membership numbers, we don't have the money to splash around anymore. So, obviously, you know, this will be done in moderation. This isn't a blanket policy where now all of our speakers will be abroad. This is a policy where, where we can save money, where we can change the way we think we're going to do that. Um, charity obviously doesn't lead to any money coming out. Um, suggesting a speaker doesn't, neither does a member's choice. Uh, socials and Twitter, having different kinds of pub quizzes uh, may serve to be a revenue raiser, but I don't think it, it costs any money. Um, yeah, so that, that's my question. Uh, any more questions? Um, yeah, on, on with I think just what you said about the fact that we have lower members now, that means we should be spending less. I think that I just fundamentally think that's an answer. Especially, I think this will be a make or break make almost very much so. Two years ago, we had uh, the issue with low membership. Uh, sorry, the term card issue and the low membership numbers and the freshers brochures that were then no longer sent out to freshers in colleges. Last year we had the, the term card um, issue where, we, where they weren't delivered on time and we didn't have the freshers there. 
and every year we've seen membership numbers declining. We can't afford to be coming back to Burnley now because we'll just see another decline next year. It's quite the opposite. We can't we can't take that approach of low members. Okay, we should cut back because then we'll just get smaller, 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 smaller until when until there's nothing. You know, until again we, we risk becoming just another debating society. We need to take advantage of this big to expand and to really engage more people again than, than we ever have before. I think that's so important. Um, we'll take a next question. You'll be coming first on that, Alistair. Uh, so, this question. Uh, uh, go, um, Toby, I can kind of first, we'll go with you, and then we'll take some others from that side of the room. Um, I understand the uni has over £100,000 in savings, yet our investment income last year was less than £200. Uh, our savings aren't being invested at all. I understand this is the responsibility of the trustees. Are the trustees in Queensland, <coughs> first of all, in, wa in wasting our money? And second of all, do you have the balls to go and fight them us? It's not true. We don't have £100,000 in savings. Most of that is assets. So that's just not true. Well, what, what, what is the dumbest on? Look, we've not going to have a debate, Chris and uh, Toby, about the exact nature of the trustees, where they put the money, shoeboxes, assets, houses, or whatever. They always get Alistair's response first. Okay, um, I'm going to respond quickly to that, then I'm just going to come back to something Jack said. Um, the trustees are ultimately legally responsible for the financial stability of uh, the union. Uh, they are not a group of people who take investment decisions lightly. Uh, and therefore they are not willing as a whole to put money into risky ventures to try and get more money back. Uh, because they have this personal legal responsibility, they are traditionally conservative people who don't want to make risks with what is a lot of money and what is the money that relies, you know, that makes this building keep its lights on. Um, so it's not that they don't have the books, it's that they're being sensible in trying to make sure that we remain financially stable for the long run because, you know, without these reserves, uh, the stability of the society would look a lot more um, in question. Just to come back very briefly, um, I'm not saying cutbacks. I've not mentioned anything about cutting money from any society, any part of the union, right? I'm just saying that in a time where we don't have as much money as we would normally, it is unwise to spend a lot of money on a potentially superfluous app, which may not actually serve to bring in new members, because bringing in new members is what we need in the long run to make sure that we have more money <coughs> available, right? Like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not advocating for, for cutbacks at all. It's just that we need to be careful about the sort, sorts of things that we do. And when our problem is one of inclusion, in one of turning people out because we have an image problem that you know explodes on Durfest and people see us as a society where they don't feel welcome, I think the first strategy should be to try and sensibly reform the parts about us that turn people away first for free before we go and spend a lot of money on an app which may not have any positive impacts for any of our members. Uh, Jack, um, just to respond to that question, first of all, I think Alistair said that most of what I would have done, um, essentially the trustees, yeah, they are ultimately financially responsible uh, for the union, so they are relatively reluctant to, to take risks, and obviously I've had them multiple times, and they're very sensible people, but, you know, they, they don't want this, this society to fall apart if we end up making risky investments, so um, I think that's, that's, that's a really valid point. Um, on the app, I think this, this again, this question, it's, it's gonna it's gonna be an important question, but I, I do beg to differ. I think you're massively placing cost first of all. Um, and of course a lot of these suggestions that I'm putting out um, the voting systems, it's about pragmatism, it's about balance, it's about saying what do we need to get people engaged. And I think it's you know, you're conflating this idea that um, reaching out and engaging is, is is you know, somehow we need to reach out and get more members to join before we, you know, engage people and internally, do you know what I mean? That's, and, and that's the point you're trying to make. If you engage people, there's going to be other members or potential members that are going to join because of that, because they're going to see, they're going to be looking inside from, from there and they're going to say, yeah, we want to join this, this engaging community, we want to join this, we want to be a part of this. And, and if we've got features like this, if we've got that, that engaging aspect, that, that is something that I think will, will attract new members. And it's a long term, again, it's a long term investment. It's something that will benefit all of our members. And, and like the video equipment, it's a long term investment, like the website indeed. Um, and I don't see why there's, there's no reason to just throw it out the, the window. It's something that's going to be totally undoable. Because again, if you need this injection, I don't think it's just a matter of, okay, we're not getting enough members, so we should ju just kind of stack it and not really spend any more. You need to inject that spend to give them something that they will make them want to join. And yes, I agree, you know, there are, there are aspects of our face value that, that need to be reformed and, and that's why I'm trying to put on a, a term full of interesting and diverse debates and events. But, there, but you need something more. 
we can't just do another term of here's some, here's some, you know, some nice debates. And sort of it's like it's got to be more. Thank you. Uh, questions. Um, so we go with um, tomorrow. Um, so it's no secret that the union is clearly inaccessible for poorer working class students. Um, I'd like to ask how the candidates would work on transforming the image and possibly the economic policy of the union uh, to promote the inclusivity of less economically well off students to promote diversity within the union. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Jack, I could just ask both candidates in the interests of time getting to the if they could just please not go on too long with their responses okay. to this. Well, yes. very good questions. Yes. Uh, Jack. Yes. Okay, oh, um, we can agree, but it's a very important question. Um, we do, yes, have high membership fees compared to a lot of other places in the university, and it's a different aspect. I will talk a bit about this um, accessible membership idea, though. It's been discussed multiple times by the trustees, and unfortunately, they've said, we're sorry, but it can't happen. You know, there's, there's, it's, it's something I think we, sh we could potentially want to do, but it's, it's just when the highest authority in the union say it's not doable, and the people with the most experience say it's not doable, then it's, it's not something we can do. But a lot of colleges obviously have uh, participation levies now and are introducing them. Um, I think we should we come up with that. And again, I think an outreach officer to work with the colleges on that and with other societies and encourage these joint events. So, for example, my um, uh, This House Believes Britain is a Racist Country debate. We could partner up with Depoka, for example, and, and let them come into that event like we do with a lot of events. I'd like to see that a lot more. And that's, that's going to be the purpose, I think, of my outreach officer position. Um, in contrast to this, the, the charity idea which sponsorship are already doing. Um, just to come back on that, um, the plan that the trustees vetoed was my initial draft of the plan, which was a six-page document explaining why we should offer um, students who are on the Durham grant uh, the life membership for the cost of an annual one. The trustees vetoed that plan because they said they did not want to discount the membership fee for anyone. They have not vetoed this plan. Uh, because they haven't really discussed it, right? Like, um, this this plan does not lose the union any money. It's just a different way of people paying for their union membership. What we would do is we would just set up a direct debit, the same way that you pay all of your bills and contracts and stuff like that, in a way that means that, you know, people increase this access. We, we do not lose any money in this scenario, and that's what the trustees had the issue with. The trustees had the issue with the risk of losing money by discounting, uh, by discounting fees. Uh, this doesn't discount fees for anyone, uh, unfortunately, uh, even though I'm in a perfect world, I would really love to stand and present to you my, my initial plan. You know, I, I was everywhere, I was having freedom of information requests and information levies and things like that. Unfortunately, Jack is right, the trustees said no, so instead I've come back with this as the next best thing that we can do to try and improve access uh, for working class students. Can I just ask, how, how, what happens, how are we going to chase up these kind of stack of papers? You know, what happens if someone turns around and says, oh, sorry, I, you know, I can't pay this now? How, well, we, we'd have them in some kind of agreement, like a direct debit, which means that you can't just cancel a direct debit halfway through. We, and if, so we're going to force people to, to keep paying effectively that. Well, Housecom is pretty violent these days, so I'm sure they could go in. But no, like, no, the, point is, right, the reason is, is like, you, you pay for contracts, okay? E everyone in here pays on some kind of monthly agreement where they sign a 24 month contract for their phone, right? Like, E, don't sit up at night and worry that you're going to just disappear off the face of the earth and they'll never be able to get the money back. Because they have this, this agreement and they have this payment system to make sure that you can pay, right? Like, it's, it, 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 it's, people would have to abscond off the face of the earth. Their credit score would be shot. And people won't do this, right? Like, the, the, me the accountability mechanisms that exist for things like direct debits mean that if you don't pay, but to keep, you know, keep trying to use the product or something like that, then, they then you know, your credit score is gone, basically. And, sorry, sorry, these, these points of information or questions, uh, people are seeing their hands up whilst the people are speaking, yes or no, if, if they are, please keep your hands up, if not, then, uh, the questions, um, just very quickly, um, Kat, then, Chris, uh, these points of information, quickly. Points of information, yes, <coughs> thank you, I too have a contract with EU, the difference is that if I stop paying mine and I keep receiving a service, I get a bailiff knocking at my door. And I just don't see how that necessarily makes the union a more welcoming place to know that we're going to have um, creditors you know, if you have a situation where you sign up something. And I'm quite serious all those are over there because they are hot on chasing payments in this university. I don't think it necessarily makes any more welcoming. I think a one-off payment is, is okay. It's not as high as Oxbridge payments. Um, it's quite reasonable. I think is it 
Seventy, eight, sixty. No, I'm sorry. Put your hand up, and I will call you. Okay. No shouting out about it. Just I just want to make okay? some information so, about the cost, the cost of membership. Thank you. Thank you. It covers life, and that's the life line. Life the whole life, the whole life through until you're eighty or ninety, and it's by sixty, seventy pounds. I think, and you could frankly spend that much at a week in the pub. I, I think you know. It's, it's not as big as issue as people are making out, and there is financial support available, and I don't think having you know, people chasing you for money... Thank you. Uh, if we can build fact information, please, only, and then we can uh, take critical points to questions. Uh, is that a point of information? Yes. Um, I'm worried about what infrastructure we have to enforce this. The university is obviously this massive institution. They have their own department for direct debit and for chasing up payments. We don't have that kind of infrastructure. We can't send house comm to people's accommodations, <laughs> locking down their doors if suddenly they change their direct debit or they don't have money in their account. And also, we as a charity don't want to do that. These are points of information on the question at hand. Uh, these are to be offering strictly factual information. They are to be uh, kept short and snappy. And I will rule out of order or call out anybody who may further political or any political points to there. So if you've got a point of, uh, because I think it was, um, I forgot where we were going, but I think it was Jack responding to the question about which was tomorrow's original question. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so if anybody's got any more points of information, so is that one there, Jack, very quickly? Yeah. Um, surely if you only pay partly for a service, um, then their membership, and you absconded, then the membership would be cancelled. Yes. Uh, so you'd have to eventually. Okay, can we, okay, we can talk about E and British gas and whatnot for uh, hours. We're not, okay, we can please get back to the case, case of hand. Uh, Jack. I, I mean, I, Jack, your analysis kind of empty might be, he's just said that there wouldn't be cancellation of membership if they are saying that they wouldn't, it wouldn't be like if they stop paying and cancel the membership, pay 20,000 and cancel the membership. No, I was no, I was saying that members wouldn't pay twenty pounds, cancel their debit, yeah. and then keep their membership. Very good. Okay. Point of information. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay, perfect. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, I think there's one over there. There's a point of information, Jeremy. Uh, yeah, just speaking as a current brand, for Sethi and myself, um, I didn't find any, I didn't have any cards about paying my life membership fee when I started. Cool. Okay, right. let's get back to some uh, <laughs> questions. <laughs> let's get back to some questions, uh, shall we? <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, what are your thoughts on no platforming, certain speakers? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Uh, we're back with Jack. Yeah. Um, essentially, as a, as a chamber of free speech and as, as a free speech society, um, we are very much open to, to inviting as many speakers. Uh, as possible, but of course we're limited given that uh, we have an agreement with the university and certain agreements with the university and that this is their building, essentially. Um, of course, they <coughs> do have the right to um, no platform certain speakers that we invite and there's unfortunately nothing we can do about that um, in some cases. In some cases, of course, it's a valid thing to do, but um, it's, it's down to the university. Unfortunately, it's not down to the president. Um, I would think it would be last. Alistair? Um, very briefly. Jeremy, um, I think the best thing that we could offer students on a term grant is as much choice and as freedom as possible. Therefore, you know, if you were able to pay uh, your fee and you were very happy to do that, you know, great. Uh, having worked with you on GenCom, we, you know, it's a pleasure to have you. So obviously, you know, that doesn't change your circumstance. This is for people for whom you know, it would be an issue. And so the opportunity cost there means that we would still proportionally be gaining more money than even if like, they do back then. Um, no platform. Um, I think that as, again, as during all this and larger society, we have a responsibility to, our, to ourselves, to our members, and to our university uh, not to platform people who um, would do damage to the well-being of our members as a whole, and not people who do damage to the, the quality of debate and the reputation of this institution as a whole. I believe that this is a right that should be used very carefully, because obviously as a amazing society we want to host as many people as possible. I think the platforming is something of like the nuclear option for a president. However, I think we operate on a basis of no platforming all the time. When a president looks at his list in his press con and decides who he wants to invite and who he doesn't, he no platforms people by not inviting them all the time. We have chosen not to invite people because we thought, you know, it's just 
not worth the hassle. They don't add that much to the discussion. In fact, often, our, the controversial speakers that come uh, to societies like in Oxford and Cambridge and Trinity and people like that just derail the debate and it becomes a mess and an entirely fruitless one in which no one learns. Therefore, I think we should try to make the debate as high quality as possible. And if no platforming uh, certain individuals is a way that we have to do that, then obviously I'm more than willing to do it. Uh, more questions? I uh, will take... Uh Mr. Jay, turn me off, sorry, open the door. I'm working on bar tonight. Okay, uh, very, very quickly. Uh, thank, thank, thank you, Freddie. Uh, thank you for your fine work. Thank you. owns 24s. Uh, we have an agreement with them whereby we, are, we have something of a monopoly on this room, uh, but that has its points and where the intersect between the university ownership and the union ownership comes into clash when we talk to them. Um, uh, so that, that's very much on an issue by issue basis when people try to book this room, it's often through us, uh, however the university can control like overall uh, this building. The same is true of 24s. How do we make most use of this space? Um, I think that the, the, the events we run at 24s are often fantastic. I think that we can do more to try and reflect the interests uh, and passions of our membership base as a whole. That's why I think we should do more pub quizzes on potentially more fun things. Because whilst we are like an intellectual society at our core, you know, we're all about free speech and debate and trying to aspire for higher ideals of knowledge by coming here and spending our Friday nights not at the pub but instead listening to academics talk about, you know, liberalism and stuff like that. I think occasionally on a Sunday night maybe we can let loose a little and, you know, ha uh, sit, around, sit around the pub uh, and have a pub quiz about something, you know, TV shows, movies, stuff that we all like. Uh, it's things that you know, our normal members who don't come to these debates would like to come to, get involved. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen, but um, frustratingly, uh, after I wrote this manifesto, um, Missoula uh, published that they were going to be doing a Brooklyn Nine Nine quiz, and that's already sold out. They've sold out the whole of Missoula for about eight pound a person, right? Like, yeah, I'm sorry, sir. I wanted to be on the team with you too, but alas, uh, we didn't get it. Um, but no, you know, so there is definitely interest in these sorts of things, and by using it for all of our members rather than just reserving it for the intellectual base that we have, I think that's useful. As for using this chamber, um, obviously this is a, much, is a much more restrictive page due to the benches. We lose control of it during exam time as this is used as an exam room. That's one of the places where our ownership sort of intersects. Um, how do we use it? By just putting on the best addresses, the best debates we possibly can. And I think that we do that by picking sensibly who we, who we get, uh, by moving the money around in a way that means it's always benefiting our members first. Um, and yeah, I think that's how we do it. Uh, Jack. Yeah. Um, I'd agree. I think, I mean, I'm very happy for the assistant custodian to decide uh, what the public wizards are. But I, I'd encourage them to mix it up a bit, um, but I think that's, that's, that's at their discretion. Um, in terms of this chamber, I think we should be at more actively publicising the use of this chamber. Uh, I think it's a fantastic asset for any society to use, and again, that's where my outreach office comes in. If we want other societies coming in, either using it with us or um, as, as their own event. Um, Again, the Sponsorship Careers Fair, which some of you may have seen, um, and this idea of bigger networking events, this is a fantastic space. So we had a Teach First networking event in here uh, last term, which was fantastic. We had a very good turnout for that, and I think if we can get some bigger sponsorship events, that can really help with our sponsorship as well, um, and our sponsorship funding. Um, I think it's a fantastic space for that. Um, and again, the, the reading room as well at 24s, I think we should be more actively publicising that because it's a fantastic spot for socials, as I'm sure many of you will know, having been to some of our socials. Um, and I think, I think that's, a, that's a really good thing to push for other societies to use through this outreach office of position. Any more questions? We'll have a point. Um, and so people can vote beforehand and then see if they change their opinion afterwards. Um, and it's just always it's just how things need to change um, about the how we, we approach debates and events. And, and not just kind of sticking with the with the old, um, you know, everyone turns up, secretary reads minutes, the last meeting, etc., and then they just kind of you know, speak here and then everyone leaves. It's, it's it's about more than that. It's about what it is around the event and outside the event that, that you get um, to, to 
to encourage people to, to actually paddle on. Uh, Alistair? Um, I think you do yourself a disservice, Chris, because I, I think the two motions that you labelled as um, white, male and stale, or however it was, I, I don't think they are particularly. I think your term was fantastic and it was an honour to work with you. Um, obviously in delivering the LGBT plus panel um, under your guidance, uh, which, you know, because you use a different joy. Um, you know, that was, that was a side yeah. I think in terms of why um, going forward we don't often have as many um, people come to these, is that in some cases people just think we are too far gone. Um, I think there are times where, for especially for third and second years, uh, they have grown, well not grown up, that's probably a poor choice of words, but they have spent their time in direct uh, seeing, you know, the only coverage of, of their union uh, being being our scandals, uh, being some sometimes where things have gone wrong, and ha how do we change that message? I think for starters, um, we, there are small improvements that we can make to the address, uh, to the address of the mention that you talked about. For example, right. um, so things like uh, polls for what speakers they want to see, or indeed uh, leaflets for their campaign. Um, you know, uh, wide publicity of the debate results, um, and and making these more a part of the events. So, you know, you could even have, for example, a survey before the debate, um, and so people can vote beforehand and then see if they change their opinion afterwards. Um, and it's just all these kind of small things that change um, about how we are capable of, when necessary, going against opposition in the status quo for the sake of positive change. So, so it gives me that again. So, so it gives me the question again. Sorry, you were not good asking questions, which is more than likely. Have your respective candidates proved themselves? against opposition and status quo for the sake of positive change? I think Alistair definitely has. He brought up an accessibility platform. That platform was rejected. The way that Alistair reacted to that wasn't to stop trying immediately in order to distance himself from the union. It was about working with the feedback that he got on that policy to come to one that we are all happy with. I think that when we look at those controversies and we look at the willingness to be controversial, um, as a policies officer and as somebody who's brought up those kinds of policies, um, it's something that Alistair has a track record of doing, but I don't think he does it for the sake of being controversial, and I think that's the key thing that we need to recognize here, because I think he shows a genuine willingness to try to get to the truth of the question of what we all want in this union. And controversy is necessary, but I think we need to go about it in the right way, in the way where we eventually come to a consensus at the end. And to finish up the last so, Stephanie, it's not all that immediately lends itself to this. I mean, as Dan is demonstrating, you don't talk a lot during this time, so Jack didn't get much opportunity to have a voice during these kind of events. However, um, the app that you're also in the scenes being raged about, that is trying to go against the grain. It's something we've not done before. So, that is controversial. Think how much debate that sparked. So, and also in terms of speakers, he worked really, really hard in terms of on, on Prescom, inviting speakers that hadn't been invited before and working with me to help um, get BME speakers and, um, and more diversity and panels discussions. So Jack really is very capable and has a lot of experience with the union. So go Jack Perry.
Um, we've got Clash Box, the office if anyone would like to do anything, please do, it would be great. With that, um, then we'll also be having a collection box set up at 24s at the bar, so please give your loose change to that rather than the bar staff who are busy as it is now. Thank you very much. With that, I close the meeting. Selling along, publishing it online. That is why you need to reach out. And also, I'm happy to chat to you about, I'm sure Jack will engage with me or my successor without having socials, making those bigger. I know that was also a vision of Charlie as well when he was elected to try and help out there. So I think that would be his main vision, which is around publicising it. So it was like, there was the first, um, I think Chris did a publicity around the Freshers' Fair and the first um, debates training there. So <coughs> we'll just continue that and also build on that as well. Um, I think one of the things that Alistair has done and would continue to do is open up the debate competitions that we host for competitive debaters so that union members that don't choose to take part in that part of the union feel welcome in them. That's what happened when Alistair had the first open final of our uh, competition that we host in Durham. I think that's a really important step because it should be a symbiotic relationship between the two sides of the union as opposed to things that are completely separate. Moreover, um, I think that Alistair through his experience in representing Durham internationally, but also through the connections that I'm very proud to say he's formed within debate societies the country over, um, would be very well placed to provide the publicity not just here, but across the country where we might be getting students from for why the, the Durham Union is a great place to go for debating. Um, so yes, I, th I think his experience in debating, as he already mentioned, I'm not gonna go through it again, um, is very, very strong and very, very committed. Um, and I think he's wanting to bring that more to the people who might not choose to engage with that side of the union, which I think is something we should all welcome. Uh, any more questions? Do you think your candidates, as moral and upstanding people, would appreciate us bringing the meeting to a close swiftly so we can all go and get pints? <laughs> <laughs>